Welcome to lesson five of module one, Cells as the Basis of Life. In this video, we're gonna be looking at the processes and requirements of, uh, that are undertaken and required by different cell types um, in terms of the food that they eat, uh, the energy and how they obtain it, um, and waste and water. Um, again, we're looking at how cells coordinate um, their internal um, environment with their external environment. A uh, heterotroph is something that we're going to refer to in this video and it where it feeds on something different. So it consumes other organisms, um, including all animals and fungi. Um, animal cells do not contain chloroplasts and therefore they must obtain their substances that they need from their external environment. So they're uh, referred to as a heterotroph. An autotroph is what we refer to as self-feeding. So plant cells contain chloroplasts and they're able to produce their own uh, nutrients by photosynthesis. Um, in this process, they're making their own organic compounds from inorganic compounds. Autotrophs are also called producers, um, but they're fundamental to the existence of all organisms. Here we can see here that the process is undertaken by autotrophs and heterotrophs uh, occur in a cycle. And we can see that they um, both include uh, and uh, required the process of photosynthesis and cellular respiration to keep this cycle going. When we talk about chemical compounds in this video, we're talking about uh, two categories, inorganic and organic. So inorganic compounds are those without any carbon atoms um, and with only one or two carbon or they might contain only one or two carbon atoms. When we refer to organic, they contain um, many carbon molecules and hydrogen atoms. Inorganic uh, compounds include water, uh, which is an important solvent and transport medium, oxygen, which is needed for energy supply, carbon dioxide, uh, which is the source of carbon for organic molecules, nitrogen and minerals. And then we have our organic compounds, which are carbohydrates, which are our energy sources and make up structural components of cells, lipids, which are present in cell membranes and uh, they are integral in energy storage, proteins, which are composed of amino acids. Um, it also includes enzymes, hormones, and they're part of the cell membrane. And then we have nucleic acid, which uh, carries genetic information of the cell uh, in DNA and RNA. So here we can see some organic compounds. We can see the carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, and um, some of the examples here and what they might look like. When we talk about energy uh, with, that are used by the cell, they use a form of energy known as adenosine triphosphate, otherwise known as ATP. It's the universal carrier of energy, and the energy comes from high energy bonds that are between the inorganic phosphate groups. And um, when these are broken down, they release energy. Uh, so we can see up in the top here that when it is broken down, we can, um, the bonds are just broken. So the components themselves can then readily combine back uh, together uh, to form an ATP molecule again. And here we can see how this cycle from ATP to ADP is regenerated. When we talk about the different processes that occur in different types of cells, we have cellular respiration and we have photosynthesis. And in this um, diagram here, we can see that they're almost um, a flip side, um, but there are many different processes that go on in respiration and in photosynthesis to make these um, equations happen. When we talk about photosynthesis, uh, it occurs in a plant cell. Um, mainly in the chloroplasts, uh, where they have glucose and oxygen molecules. And then cellular respiration occurs in the mitochondria of an animal cell, and here they produce carbon dioxide and water, which is uptake by the plant cell. Within photosynthesis, um, it can only occur in plant cells if they can obtain carbon dioxide, water and light from their external environment. And once they are able to obtain those, uh, they go through a reaction which produces sugars and oxygen. Again, this occurs in the chloroplast um, and the chloroplast contain chlorophyll, which is a green pigment. Uh, and this pigment absorbs energy from the sunlight. There are two stages to the photosynthesis reaction. The first one is light dependent, and this is where the chlorophyll captures the solar energy and uses this to produce ATP. So it combines that AZP with a phosphate molecule. Water is split into hydrogen ions and oxygen gas, um, and it occurs in the thylakoid membranes, um, otherwise known as the granule of the chloroplast. 
Stage two is light independent reactions. And this is where we produce the glucose, the water and the ATP. So the ATP made in stage one provides energy for the dark reactions as we um, call them because they don't, this part doesn't require the light. And it combines the carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions to form glucose and water. And this occurs in the stroma or the fluid part of the chloroplast. There are some factors which affect the rate of photosynthesis, one of which is light intensity. So in low light, the light dependent reactions cannot occur. But as the light intensity increases, the, road, the rate of photosynthesis will increase, um, but it does only increase until a certain point. The next is carbon dioxide concentration. When there is no carbon dioxide available, photosynthesis cannot occur either. Uh, but when carbon dioxide becomes available, again, photosynthesis will occur up until a certain point. And the temperature well, that affects the functioning of the enzymes that catalyze the reactions of photosynthesis. So this plays an important role in um, the rate of photosynthesis. Here we have now respiration, and this is where the glucose and oxygen is used to produce usable energy uh, and carbon dioxide is formed as waste. This occurs in the cytosol and in the mitochondria of cells and chemical energy is transformed um, from that stored in organic compounds into a usable form of energy, uh, which is stored in the bonds of ATP. In respiration, there are again two stages. So we have glycolysis in which glucose molecules split into two parts. It doesn't require oxygen this stage and it occurs in the cytosol of a cell. So glycolysis is always happening. Stage two is where the respiration process can branch off depending on the presence of oxygen. So aerobic is where oxygen is present and anaerobic respiration is where there's no oxygen present. Uh, respiration that occurs with oxygen present produces almost 20 times the number of ATP molecules, um, whereas anaerobic respiration uh, can continue to produce ATP, uh, but only for a short period of time when there's not enough oxygen available. Anaerobic respiration uh, does in fact produce lactic acid, and that's what you'll notice uh, uh, the heavy feeling in legs as that lactic acid, you're lacking oxygen from uh, fast paced movements, you're not breathing enough, you feel that lactic acid build up in your legs and that's that heavy feeling and that's because your body's not get, getting enough oxygen to produce that energy. One of the other processes that occurs in cells is the removal of waste and this removal is crucial because as cells function, they produce substances uh, from their meta metabolic reactions. Um, that are no longer useful to them. If these waste substances are allowed to accumulate in the cells, it can prevent the cells from functioning properly. Uh, to main, so to, to maintain uh, the right conditions, uh, these waste substances need to be removed from the cell. So there's two ways in which it can be removed. So both passive and active, so no energy and using energy. So um, water molecules that are produced, uh, they move out of the cell by osmosis, uh, diffusion of oxygen, carbon dioxide, ammonia and alcohol, um, and there can be some facilitated diffusion of urea, glucose and other ions. Um, but we need to actively um, transport out of the cells any urea, which is produced um, in our liver, and then any toxins and ions being removed against their concentration gradient, um, either via endocytosis or exocytosis. Uh, there are two different processes uh, for autotrophs and heterotrophs. Um, so autotrophs, most waste that is produced is byproducts. Uh, they don't have any specialized excreta organs. Um, and because of their low metabolic rate, there's almost no true waste. In heterotrophs, cells are constantly breaking down and being replaced. Um, and they're replacing the carbohydrates and the lipids and the nucleic acids. Um, and these cannot be used by the body. So therefore, heterotrophs have more complex excretory structures and processes uh, to remove this waste and maintain that uh, balance. So in heterotrophs, carbon dioxide um, is one of the waste products produced by cellular respiration. And that's removed by diffusing across, across respiratory membranes um, and then breathed out or by a specialized organ, so gills of fish. Uh, water uh, and only excess water is removed. Uh, so we can um, breathe that out as water vapor, or we can uh, remove it uh, in the form of urine from our kidneys. Um, but most water is reabsorbed to maintain our hydration. And then we also have to remove any nitrogenous waste. Um, and this is managed by the liver, uh, but it's regulated by the kidneys and excreted as urea in mammals. 
Uh, the liver prepares substances for excretion, so it detoxifies any harmful chemicals and breaks down uh, amino acids to release ammonia. Uh, and then in mammals, we convert that to urea uh, as a less toxic form of ammonia. And then our kidneys also excrete waste after performing filtration, reabsorption and active secretion. Um, and this process is performed by functioning units called nephrons. That concludes video five. Make sure you tune in for 